Uh, we're getting to the end. We're going to last, last couple topics we haven't covered yet that we just need to touch on. So one, I just had you guys watch some of our my previous discussions about climate change, and that that's really um, fact-based stuff primarily. And so we'll talk about a little bit of facts now. And just I wanted to bring you guys up to speed. A lot has changed in the last year. So all those things that I, I said before in those previously recorded lectures are they haven't really changed that much, right? So those are all good. You guys, if you haven't watched those, you should watch those. That's sort of an overview of climate change in the context of coastal management. But obviously a lot has changed in the last year in particular. Huge changes in terms of our the management uh, realm in which we live. So I'm not trying to be political here. I'm just, we did, but, we, but as a group that talks about management, we need to talk about the changed landscape, right? So this is not trying to disparage anyone or, or cause or introduce bias, whatever, but, but it, it's, it's the world that we're, we live in. So um, uh, obviously the, the biggest thing that's happened in the last year is that we've had a, a major shift in terms of the politics in our country, in terms of the folks that are leading us in, in, in responding to climate change. And, and no surprise here that that was the election of President Trump in the 2016 presidential election. And that's changed a bunch of stuff. So I wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what's been happening. And then I want to talk about some of the things that have gone on, all of which have impacts in terms of uh, our engagement with coastal management. And the when you guys graduate and go out into the working field, you guys might have to deal with um, various aspects of these things. So uh, to, to get us in the right mode, I just want to touch base and remember where we were before 2006. Um, this was the world really before 2006. So there's various things here. On the upper left, we have Governor Schwarzenegger, uh, who, when he was governor of California, this was him at uh, my father-in-law's company in Silicon Valley. Uh, that's not my father-in-law, but, but that, that uh, was, the guy on the right was the, he since passed away, but he was the owner of this company that makes smart technology to control the building here and, and, and be really efficient with, with uh, lighting and things of that nature. And so we had the governor of California. Does anybody know who the guy to the left of him is in the upper left there? Is that? Uh, yes, it is. From New York? No. <laughs> well, yeah, from New York, that's right. Ban Ki-moon, so that was the, the former uh, head of the United Nations. I was hoping Lisa, who was on Model UN. Oh, I didn't hear, okay, there, I should have. What a jerk I was. I should have asked Lisa to speak up louder. But, but yeah, so basically, we have the head of the UN, the head of our state government, and, and a, a leader in technology in Silicon Valley, one of our leaders of our economy, getting together. And this is not required. This wasn't forced on them by some kind of government law or whatever. It's just these folks all said, hey, this is, this is a really great thing. We can come together. In, in the, this case, it was over clean technology and clean tech. And how can we engage uh, together at multiple levels, international, state, private sector, whatever, and do some cool stuff? So we were seeing a lot of that stuff going on. Although, back in the day, this was still noteworthy, right? This was still got headlines that this was happening. So it was seen as something new. It, was, it wasn't done all the time. Uh, and, and, uh, and you'll note here, there's no federal actor here, right? The president of the United States is not there. The energy secretary is not there. This is, this is really, really big worldwide, but yet it doesn't involve, um, at least in this particular example, didn't involve the federal folks directly. On the right is Hurricane Katrina, which hit in 2005. And some of you guys will be coming with us to uh, New Orleans this year. Some of you guys have already been with us. But that was really a watershed moment in getting people um, to understand what climate change might look like in the coastal zone, right? So again, not, not, not that we're saying it, the entirety of the storm was caused by climate change and stuff, but, but it really freaked people out. And it really, for many Americans, showed them what a, a changed world was going to be like. And so I like the term global weirding. I use the term global weirding. Because that, to me, is the best term for what we're beginning to experience, what we've been experiencing, and what we're going to be experiencing more and more and more. Things are going to get out of. Things are going to become very different from our historic experience, 
And so in this case, this was this you know, crazy storm and it, and it uh, flooded American City, etc. If we follow the, the arc of our pictures here down to the right, that is uh, President Al Gore when he was giving um, a lecture that would become the movie in Convenient Truth. This was, this was uh, he used to come by where we were um, and give, give these talks before uh, they started making the movie. But basically that notion of, hey, we can talk to people. The, what's going on is people don't understand what's going on. Let's, let's give them some more information. And that's a way to, to go forward and come together as a, as a society and, and solve this problem and, and go on. And then related to that, if we jump off to the left, there was this thing called Climate Connection several years ago on National Public Radio that did a really nice job of going to non-traditional venues and talking about how climate change is manifesting itself. All of this discussion we're having, or virtually all of this discussion we're having, is a uniquely American phenomenon. We are different than almost all of the rest of the world. This is pre-2016 I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, there's a few places, a few kind of crazy places like parts of the Australian outback and stuff where there was some similar stuff. But by and large, we were, we, this, this phenomenon that you guys all hear about and we all think about and we talk about, oh my gosh, climate change is such a controversial thing. It's like abortion or something else is hot button political issue. That's an American thing. In, the, in this middle picture here, this is uh, on the lower left, this is, I'm having some falafel on this shop in this Turkish, Turkish town on the border with Iran. This is about 11 years or so ago, and we're eating, and what you're looking at is a news, there's a TV in the corner, and uh, we're, my back is the TV, and we're eating, 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 and all of a sudden, in the middle of lunch, the entire restaurant gets super quiet, and everybody shuts up, and they turn, they look at the TV screen. And so I turn around, and we have a lot of problems with these PKK terrorists and stuff there, so I thought, oh my gosh, it's a... It's a, a bombing or something like that, right? So I turned around and look, and there didn't look like a bombing. And there weren't guys running around playing soccer. So I was like, what the hell is going on? So, I, I, you know, everybody else is listening. And then after maybe 30 seconds or whatever, uh, it, the guy, the newscaster finishes his paragraph and goes on to another story. And everybody, oh, they picks up their forks and they go back to eating. And the din of the restaurant grows again. I turn to my friend and say, what was that? Was, that, was there some... Uh, crazy thing? And they said, oh no, it was a story about climate change. So every single person in that restaurant, the wealthy, it, was, it wasn't a lot of wealthy people, but, but, but wealthy people, poor people, farmers, whatever, when the climate change story came on, everybody shut up. The waiters shut up, the chefs shut up, and they all wanted to hear it because they knew that this would have direct impact on them, mostly in terms of water availability for their farming and stuff. But it was a really interesting example of how this wasn't a controversial thing. This was, hey, this guy's talking about this important subject. Let me hear what the, the most recent development was. Again, this was pre-2016. Okay, then we had 2016. <laughs> then the, the, the crazy wild ride uh, continued. And we entered the current era where um, we are now. And so it's important to say, again, I'm not trying to attack anybody politically here, but as scientists, I think it's important for us to make sure we speak from, from facts and we talk about what's really going on. And there's a lot of stuff that's happening. There's a lot of stuff here that's, that's not fact-based. And as folks that are grounded, all of our management stuff, that our discussion we just had about what's good, what's bad, all of that needs to be rooted in reality. And unfortunately, that's maybe not always the case in some situations right now. So for example, the classic one that we hear about is this uh, tweet from our president before he was president, this is in 2012, where he famously said that global warming was uh, created by and for the Chinese. That's uh, not true. Um, but the, as of when I grabbed this uh, this weekend, that, that individual tweet had been retweeted over 100,000 times, right? And it had been liked almost 70,000 times. So that says that, you know, for whatever we want to say about social media, that, it, that indicates a pretty strong interest, I think it's, it's safe to say. And, um, you know, uh, all, it, it's, it's a weird world that we find ourselves in. 
The world that we find ourselves in is one that most of us have not been well prepared to engage in. We're prepared to engage in, hey, do we do this process to the salmon or not? Let's do a study, find out, and then when we find out that if this works, good, we're gonna do this to the salmon. If it doesn't work, hey, let's not do that to the salmon. That's not the world that we're in by and large uh, in terms of the policy world these days, at least not at the federal level. So we are at the world of anecdotal and I think, and I really would like it to be like this. So for example, um, here are some tweets from uh, our president. And uh, this first one, he says, uh, in the 1920s, people were worried about global cooling. It never happened. Now it's global warming. Give me a break. So these are all fallacies. These are all logical fallacies. Um, in this case, this is what's known as a hasty generalization and then outrightly fact, just not true at all. Um, we could talk about this notion that they changed the name from global warming to climate change after the term global warming just wasn't working. That's just not even factually correct. The term climate change was invented by a Republican strategist because they thought global warming was too scary a term. So the term climate change was actually created to make people more comfortable with it. And it turns out it's actually a better term in many respects because not everything is always going to get warmer. Sometimes it's going to get wetter. Sometimes it's going to get drier. And so climate change is, is you know, a, a term that was originally used as a propaganda tool actually turned out to be um, more useful. So we, we more typically use climate change now than global warming. So this, everything about this, there's, there's not even a fallacy here. It's just not true on any level. Um, and then we have things like false equivalencies that we hear about a lot. So in this case, this is give me clean, beautiful, and healthy air, which I think we all agree with, right? We all like that. Uh, not the same old climate change exploded, deleted. Um, I'm tired of hearing this nonsense, right? So, so this is a false equivalency, this notion that climate change is different from clean air and things of that nature. And we can go on and on, which I'm not going to. But th it's, it's, it's a challenging world for we as scientists who are trained to only speak to what we know in terms of the facts to engage in these, in these events. And so um, it's very clear that what's been going on is an, is an active misinformation campaign, an active deception campaign that's aimed at you and all of our fellow citizens. And this, this poison has actually worked fairly well from the perspective of the folks that were attempting to poison you. Um, and it, it's, it's done its work. It's, it's, it's a, been a highly effective propaganda exercise. And so the top there is a story from uh, last month um, about changing minds and it references, so I'll just read to you, one says, if someone is already not on board with climate change or is just disengaged and feels like it doesn't matter, more information, which is what you and I are typically trained to do, oh, they don't understand? We should explain to them again. We should do another study. Um, uh, more information about ocean acidification, attribution of extreme weather events. Um, maybe that's not going to work, and I'll show you some evidence in a second. And, and a related study from a few years ago where, um, and I'll show you the data in a sec, where it says members of the public with the highest degrees of science literacy are not the most concerned about climate change. Rather, they're the ones um, among whom cultural polarization is the greatest. And so that's this data right here. So this is um, uh, data from this and similar studies. This, this particular study is 2016. But what we're looking at here is, is um, educational attainment on the bottom axis. So um, high school up to postgraduate degree on the right. And what you see is um, the, the bifurcation in terms of people by political affiliation. There's different, different political associations there. Um, is the greatest amongst folks that have uh, the highest postgraduate degree. Now, a lot of this is probably MBAs in the business world, but nevertheless, it, it suggests that simple, simply educating folks isn't necessarily the way to move forward with this and, and to try to come to some type of an agreement. Um, all of these things, all of these examples right here are examples of active misinformation campaigns and, and attempts to to debunk real science. On the upper left was um, from a, a, over 100 years ago where um, we started figuring out that, hey, washing your hands will reduce germs. And if we wash our hands before surgery, that's going to lead to less infection. People are going to survive more. 
there, was a, there were many physicians that pushed back against that hardcore. All the data existed to show that if you washed your hands, that would be less infections, people do better. So of course, all we have to do is go talk to people, right? And show, wash their hands and then show them. That didn't work, at least not initially. Eventually, eventually reality won out, eventually facts won out. But in the early goings, this uh, Hungarian scientist that came up with this had, had some hard goings. People tried to undercut him said this was baloney, this was some kind of conspiracy, because people didn't want to change what they, the, the, not people, the professional folks, the doctors, didn't want to change what they were doing. Um, if, we, if we rock through on the lower left, this is a, um, a famous ad, um, a racist ad in the wake of Reconstruction after, uh, after the Civil War in the South. And Freeman's Bureau was essentially a, a federal agency to help folks that were previously enslaved, uh, you know, to basically help them out. And this was basically this huge propaganda, racist drawings, racist statements, factually incorrect statements about how, oh my God, man, all these, all these people are super lazy. They don't really want to work. They don't want to do this and that. Again, active misinformation campaign designed from the get-go to, to play on, your, on people's inherent fears, biases, racism, all that kind of stuff. And it was very effective. It, it was really effective at, at, at inculcating the Jim Crow laws and all these other uh, continue injustices that we are still dealing with in our country. If we continue rocking around, um, the most relevant model for us, the most directly applicable model in the context of coastal management and dealing with climate change is the, the controversy over smoking. And so this is an ad from the 1950s now, scientific evidence of effects of smoking. If you read it, I'll read it for you. Sure, of course I'll read it for you. It says, uh, a medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. 45% of this group have smoked Chesterfields for an average of over 10 years. After 10 months, the medical specialist reports that he observed, dot, 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 no observed effect on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfields. Hey, it's best for you, right? And I could, I could, we could show you ads like this all day long, right? <laughs> Active <laughs> disinformation, right? Actively attempting, but, but, but acknowledging that inherently in here, there's something about the scientist guy up there on the upper left. There's something about the government agency on the lower left. So, so there's this notion of, we can't just say stupid, no, uh-uh. We have to, we have to, suck that into our worldview. We have to say that we're the better scientists and that what's actually going on is we need to study the problem more. And we need to, we need to um, you know, have our competing scientists, for us versus them and all this and that. That's all by design. That's all by design to lead, get you to buy more cigarettes. That's all by design to make you think that there is not a consensus, which there is. And so that's what's been going on. Um, again, this sounds like I'm on a political tirade here. I'm not, I'm not, I'm really not trying to do that. I'm just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with this. This was, now, I don't think people in the oil and gas industry are evil. There's, they're great folks in the oil and gas industry, but I, I don't think they're evil. There are some folks though that are, have done what I would consider to be massively inappropriate massively disingenuous activities. Um, and one of the examples of that would be these, when folks knew there was a danger, decided, observed there was a danger and didn't announce that there was a danger, and in fact, said exactly the reverse. When they knew cigarettes were addictive and caused cancer, it's one thing to say, hey, cigarettes are addictive and cause cancer, you know, let's deal with it. It's another thing to say exactly the opposite and to fund fake research, to fund disinformation campaigns that say exactly the opposite. That say, oh, actually what's going on is the science says cigarettes are really good for you. That, that is a very different thing. And so I'm not trying to paint all of our uh, colleagues and friends in the energy sector as bad, but, but um, the current, this current campaign started in 2015 with two different stories from Climate Central, an investigative piece from Climate Central and the Los Angeles Times, and it's evolved into now a lawsuit and all this kind of stuff. The short version is that 
Um, there were several entities. API is the American Petroleum Institute. For complete, uh, you know, um, disclosure, I, I work, I do a lot of stuff with oil and gas folks, and, and a lot of them are great. I have been on record with having a disagreement with the American Petroleum Institute, and we've had an academic peer-reviewed debate about certain things. So just to be clear, uh, that's, that's where I'm coming from. Um, I've also accepted money from, from oil and gas folks, mostly in the context of oil spills and stuff, so, so just so that we're all on board here. Um, but uh, this is this climate change denial story. The short version is if you look on the lower uh, left here, you see a document, the so-called hidden memo from 1998, which was written at an American Petroleum Institute meeting that basically said what we need to do is we need to fool the American people. That's what's highlighted in yellow. We need to trick them into thinking uh, what we want them to think, right? Not, not a typical, of course, every corporation wants to get their message out. We're not talking about messaging. We're talking about active disinformation. In the case of Exxon, and so, so most of the attention has been directed to Exxon. Again, not trying to single anybody out here, but Exxon um, clearly was one of the main underwriters of a lot of this disinformation campaign. And I'm not going to out anybody here, <laughs> but I have many colleagues in the oil and gas industry, and many of these advocacy groups um, work, work from consensus. And uh, I'll just say, um, some oil and gas companies wanted to deal with climate change head on. And let's talk about it. Let's, let's, let's deal with it. Let's see if we can do carbon capture, whatever. Um, in some cases, there was always a holdout in these industry groups. And I would just say it might have something to do with Exxon. Um, so uh, the, our current Secretary of State is the former head of that company who was in charge of that company during this time. Um, and, and there's a quote there from um, Mr. Tillerson while he was the, uh, he, well, he, well, he was um, running Exxon and basically saying, we, we're not sure, we need to study the problem more. What this whole issue was about was the fact that Exxon knew exactly what was going on and they said different things. So for example, here's what I, when I say exactly knew what was going on, they're climate scientists, or they're, not, they're very smart people. There's brilliant folks that work for, are in the oil and gas industry. Really, really smart people, awesome technology, they really do amazing stuff. Um, and so what you're seeing on the, on the left is a graph that was used in a briefing to Exxon summarizing their, their modeling of the climate showing that, surprise, surprise, as we raise CO2 in the atmosphere, that's gonna cause what we would call climate change. 1982, that figure. What you see on the right, for example, is a, is a paid for ad in the New York Times from Exxon that says it's unsettled science. We don't know what, that's 20 years later, right? I would postulate that's disingenuous. That's not being perfectly honest. When I do my studies and, and have problems with them, as I often do, I'm very clear. Yes, you know, so I think this is what's going on, but I don't know, this also might be happening, right? A lot of times when I give you guys feedback, it's like, hey, you gotta, be on, you gotta call out when you're not sure about something, right? This is exactly the opposite of that. And this is uh, disrespectful in a democracy and I would suggest to you, as, as resource management professionals, this is a dangerous thing to have this type of behavior going on in a civil society in an open democracy. Um, as, as one measure of how much things changed in the wake of the election, all these things started spinning up in the last, in the last year. So it really started a year ago now, November, December of 2016, really got going in January of 2016, and that was um, this, this data preservation movement. So the worry was that this data that you paid for, that your parents paid for, that we paid for, that is public data, would either go away or become increasingly hidden. And as someone that's had to get data from the federal government, let me tell you, there's a lot of ways they hide it. So they don't necessarily delete it all, but they might, put it all, they might change it and put it all up in PDF form. 
non OCR PDF form where you can't, you know, there's like 10,000 sheets you have to download. So there's a lot of ways people were worried. And so in this case, people, I don't know if you guys followed the story, hackathons boiled up all across the country, New York, somewhere in Canada, California, and people started scrubbing government data servers and sucking off the data about environmental impacts and climate change and put them on publicly accessible servers because people were very worried, as has started to happen, things are starting to become hard to find in some cases. The websites have changed. Um, the, uh, a new study just came out last week suggests that showed that people that are getting government grants in the last year, the use of the term climate change has gone way down. So there's also self-censoring that, that's, that's coming into play here. So, so this notion of spontaneous data preservation for all of our political differences, and of course people have had, we, we've changed administrations many times, part of our democracy is that we can respond to this and we can, we can we deal with it. We've never had a situation like this where whoever came into power um, essentially uh, through intent or implication made people so worried that we had to make copies of all of our data. That's, that's, that's a new place that we've gone to. Um, it's obviously very, it's, it's very easy to destroy. It's very hard to build up. And so in the case of the EPA, which is one of our lead agencies of the federal government that deals with climate change, even though you and I typically think about NOAA in terms of coastal management of, of, these, of uh, climate change and stuff like that, uh, the EPA is really the, the lead agency for setting a whole bunch of stuff, regulating CO2 as a pollutant, for example, which, which a previous version, uh, previous administration's EPA didn't want to do, went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said yes, we should regulate CO2 as a, as a pollutant. Um, that's all changing now. Um, and so th these are just recent uh, headlines in the last year. The next thing that happens in March, um, uh, President uh, Trump um, rescinds Obama's uh, executive orders. President Obama's administration did very little in terms of climate change, in terms of actual laws, couldn't get anything passed. So most of the activities that he did and the, the policies and management things that he promulgated were through executive order. And so when Mr. Trump came in, he simply changed those executive orders. And that's what we're seeing here in the ceremony on March 28, where he's surrounded by the vice president, the EPA secretary, uh, uh, and then right behind him, uh, the head of, of the interior, et cetera. Um, major changes have been happening, including which I'm not allowed to say things because things have been told to me in confidence, but um, the role of, of, see, how do I say this without getting in trouble? Um, it is difficult for me to speak with colleagues in the federal government now because they've been told to not speak to university scientists. Huh. Not everybody, not everything, huh. but, but, I'll just say um, that's, that's new. <laughs> never, never had that uh, happen before. <clears throat> and so uh, this is a quote from a, a, a web uh, cast from last week uh, from uh, Kathy Jacobs, who's a professor at the University of Arizona. And she said, today we are witnessing an unprecedented level of shutting our eyes and pretending that the, that the thermometer doesn't say what it actually does. Um, so this then led to um, all kinds of stuff. And some of you guys might have participated in this. In this case, uh, two of the people quoted in this article were two of our recent graduates. So two of the people that were in your seat last year, um, where we had a march for science. In one sense, that's awesome. We love science. Science is great. But the fact that, again, a significant proportion of the public felt that we needed to have a march for science suggests that things are maybe a little changed. Um, uh, so <laughs> then uh, in June, President Trump announces that uh, we're going to pull out of the Paris climate deal, the Paris Climate Accords, which were, which were uh, agreed upon in 2015. And so now this, this, is, this gets into stuff we don't really talk about in our class, but suffice it to say, this takes, 
this takes a little bit of time. So we're beginning the exit process. Um, to be sure, to be sure, um, as you guys found in your surveys this semester, right? Not everybody thinks the way the federal administration um, has been arguing. And this is from your data. So this is, this is does, do, do our local folks in our, in our area here, do they think that climate change, not caused, not maybe it was the only source, but did it have any, maybe something to do possibly with some aspect? And so 71% of our community thinks that it was likely or very likely to have played a role. Very few people think it didn't have, it just played no role or didn't have any, any role in that. And so we get to this point about what, this was a, a, Bill Nye was giving a talk in Thousand Oaks last week that I, I took my son to, and so I took this picture. And so he was talking about de debating a, a, um, a, a climate change skeptic. And this was a, 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 he put the question card up, which was asked to his, the person he was debating. And the question was, what, if anything, would ever change your mind? And the climate change skeptic he was debating said nothing. He said, nothing you could ever tell me will change my mind. I, w I, would, I would posit to you that, hopefully that's not true, but we shouldn't beat ourselves up over the fact that some people say the world is flat. At some point, we all know the world ain't flat, right? And it's not going to do a whole lot of good to be spending years and years of our time trying to convince this someone of, re of reality or that gravity exists or whatever it is, right? So the fact that someone would say there's nothing you could possibly ever show me suggests that those are maybe not, um, maybe we need to think of other, other approaches to, to solving these problems as adults. Okay, fast forward to uh, last month. So this is COP23. This is the convention of the parties. This is of the Paris Climate uh, Agreement. And so this was the meeting in Bonn. And um, right before this, did anybody know what happened right, right before we went there? Syria, not really perhaps the most progressive, uh, uh, forward-thinking country, signed the Paris Climate Change Agreement. There was only one other country besides us. Um, Nicaragua was not a signatory of the Paris Accord, not because they didn't believe in it, because they thought it was too weak. They signed it. There is a single country in the entirety of the world now. I mean, I mean, technically we're still a party to it, but we're on the we're pulling out of it. We are the only country globally that is attempting to exit this accord. So when that happened, a group of uh, non-federal actors, primarily in the U.S. and North America, but, it, but people are all over, but, but especially it's in North America. Um, this group is called We Are Still In. And so this was universities, this was municipalities, this was counties, this was states. And in the five months between when Mr. Uh, Trump announced that we would be beginning pulling ourselves out of the Paris Climate Agreement, 2,500 signers have signed up. And when you add all those people up, in terms of the, um, so on the, on the left there, this is, left is, it's a little hard to see with the light here, but that's giga, that, that's amount of carbon emitted. So the, the country on the left, the largest emitter by far is China, then is the United States, then is India. If you just add up these 2,500 non-federal folks and what they're responsible for, it's the, it's the fourth largest emitter of carbon on the planet. What does that mean? Like, at what kind of loss? Like, what did you just... So, this is a group of people that have committed to saying we will, even though we're not a government, or no, we're not a, a, a national government, we will hold ourselves to the, to the aspirational goals of the Paris Climate agreement, even though, even though our federal entity, which is the thing that, that, inter, that, that signs the treaty, even though they are exiting the treaty, state of California, state of Washington, 
etc., have said we're going as we're going to behave as if we're still following the Paris Accord. And so these non-state actors, when we add up all of the territory and the activities and the economic activity, all of the stuff that's associated with these two, what's more than that now, but 2,500 plus, we are the fourth largest emitter of carbon on the planet. So well, that's not the same. We can't do the same thing as our nation can. We can that's, a, that's a significant chunk. And it's a non-trivial a non-trivial amount of of carbon emitted, and hopefully, therefore, a non-trivial amount of carbon reductions that will happen over the coming years, regardless of what happens in in federal policy. And and the the, the guy off to the right there, that's Russia. So we are we emit the folks that have signed this. We're still in a, agreement. Emit more carbon than the entire country of Russia. So what happened in Bonn? Okay, so, so this is how these things go. There are, there are official, and so, so what, what, is, what is a convention of the parties? This is where people get together and they check in. Hey, we have this international agreement. Are we following the rules? Are we following, you know, doing self-assessments, et cetera? And so we, there are two different areas here. One of the areas is where the government folks get together, right, the, the representatives of the, of the US government or India or whoever. And they're, they're like the, the technocrats. They're how are we going to measure emissions and all this and that? How are we going to do this accounting and this and that? Then there's another area with pavilions. And this is basically the NGOs, uh, you know, the universities, that kind of stuff. Both of these areas are so-called credentialed areas, meaning to get in, you have to, be, you have, to have an official status. You have to have a, a, a name badge thing that you wear in to get in as secure areas, right? So in other words, the general public can't go in there. The We Are Still In People and this group called Climate created this Climate Action Center, which was an, an unofficial part of the meeting. You guys with me? So the third area. So they put it up. Was not credentialed. Anybody, if you guys were on vacation in Germany, you could have walked right on over and walked up to it. And this was where um, all this really interesting stuff happened. So this is where our governor went and gave um, a very well received speech. This is where my former governor of, uh, excuse me, former mayor of New York, uh, Michael Bloomberg, gave his speech. So this became a really uh, interesting place where um, people could exchange information and, and a real important counterpoint to some of the other stuff. And so if you look at all the, the social media leads, if you look at the Instagram, this, this area was leading all the trending stuff in terms of media attention and people were interested in what's going on there. So, so that's where we were as of last month. Um, a couple comments from some folks that were there um, in terms of dealing with, in this case, all climate change. We're primarily concerned with coastal climate change, but in terms of uh, all of it, these guys talk about uh, this strong awareness in all three of these areas in Germany last month of the importance of 2020. So 2020 is a real important benchmark for changing emission scenarios, etc. And we're not that far away from it. So there's a lot of people that, are, that think that we really need to have the curb bent in terms of emissions uh, by that point. Um, and, and there are clear camps. So, so there's, there's historically, there are these two different areas. There's the end, there's the natural systems people, which are probably you and I, most of us, Hey, we need to grow more wetlands and that wetland will absorb the carbon, right? And that'll be good. We need to grow more forests and that forest will grow, absorb the carbon, right? The engineered camps are the guys that want to go build these giant carbon suckers and suck air out of the atmosphere and, and mechanically, you know, remove the carbon or whatever. And so historically, these are two different camps. Increasingly, these are starting to come together, realizing that we need to do all the above. We need to engage in all these activities at the same time. Also ubiquitous throughout this, which is something that we talk about a lot in ESRM, is this notion of equity. This notion of the wealthy countries um, are in a different ability space 
oftentimes than the developing countries in terms of their in terms of our, our our fiscal ability, our technological ability, our policy things, all that kind of stuff. And so that's a clear one. One last one here is the um, this notion that this these non-federal entities can drive impact. Companies, Microsoft was there. Google was there, Apple was there, GE was there, right? So all these, you don't have to, while it's best to have our federal folks working on it, we can still have novel solutions and approaches that come from areas other than the US federal government. And, uh, and this notion that being isolated is not a viable path. Does anybody know what happened? in the one session that the U.S. So, so the one session that the U.S. representatives attended was this session on clean coal technology. Let me know what happened during that. So all the people in the audience, an audience of maybe like 100 people or so in this, this meeting room, they all stood up and started singing a song they wrote and then they all stood up and left and walked out of the room and so the u.s representatives are there trying to talk about clean coal technology and there was nobody to talk to last month in berlin yeah in bonn uh i saw it on the news i saw it on the news so you guys you guys can look at this all up later if you guys are curious about this but but the point is um i think sometimes you guys feel really uh, down or you feel there's this giant bulldozer coming down all these great management things we've been working on fisheries MPAs all this stuff and sometimes it feels like there's these other forces outside of us that are just kind of the steam gonna steamroll over us that's not true at least that doesn't have to be true and so in this case even even though our government is our federal government is not engaged much engagement is going on there. Lots of collaborations, lots of ideas, lots of ways to think about how we could try a different technique or whatever. All that stuff's going on. Here's, one, here's, here's another thing you guys can work on. So here's some data. This is from the Yale Climate Change Project. And this is the, the most recent data they've released is from 2016. And so here's a map of the US. You guys with me? So. Uh, uh, hot, the, the warmer the colors, the hotter, the cooler the co colors, the, the lower the value. And this is how many people, th now, now our, the way we phrase our question about climate change in our surveys, it's not phrased exactly the same. So, so these, these aren't directly one-to-one -one comparable, but they're similar. This, this is the most similar question we could find in the Yale climate change one. So this says, um, how many, this is of, of adults, last year, how many of you think that <clears throat> global warming is caused by humans? We say, is global warming a, a something we should deal with seriously, right? And so the overall answer is 69% from the Yale survey of the US, so, so, so called 70% of the population said it is. In our surveys here in coastal Southern California, it's more like 78%, right? And then they have uh, the associated errors. The six, we had a 6% error rate last year. Your guys, this year, 2017, was a 7% error, but, but you guys get the, so, the, so here's this. So most of us, the vast majority of us, think that this is real and know this is real, right? So don't, well, number one, don't get bogged down thinking that everybody is insane because <laughs> most people aren't insane. But here is something that should worry us. This question, which we don't ask, maybe we should start asking this question. This question says, how many of you think that global warming will hurt you personally? Look, I mean, you don't even need to look at the numbers, just look at the colors, right? A lot of warm, ooh, it's all very cold now. So the national average, 38%. So most people don't think that this thing that we see about in the news or whatever is actually really gonna hurt them, right? They don't have a whole lot of skin in the game, at least they think. If, so here's drilling down to California, that same stuff again. <clears throat> Here are counties now. And so uh, again, uh, 
this in 2016, it, it varied depending on what county you were in, but it's basically 74 um, percent in in our in our three coastal counties that where we do our surveys. And that that pretty favorably compares to the number we got. So we get very similar data to the Yale folks. Um, and then you guys got slightly higher numbers this year in 2017, presumably because of all the attention in the election and stuff. Um, but again, here is our area. Our area is still only only about 40 odd percent to 50 percent of our local residents say that climate change is going to impact them personally. So that means that people aren't understanding that this is really, really directly relevant to them. Yes, it might hurt some small island nations. Yes, it might hurt Bangladesh. But a lot of people don't don't see it as impacting them. So that is another venue that you guys can engage with.